Welcome. My name is Christine Bentley, and I'm associate faculty in art, in the art department here, specifically art history. I'm also the gallery director of the MSU Fiverr Art Gallery. And I am pleased to introduce Dr. Patricia Behrman. She comes to us from Wellesley College, where she is a Theodora and Stanley Feldberg Professor of Art. From 2010 to 2015, she held a faculty position at the University of Oslo, where she lectured and led the Edvard Munch Research Consortium. She specializes in the art and culture of the late 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Dr. Behrman holds a PhD in art history from New York University. Her research interests include turn of the century European art, especially in Scandinavia, and mid-century American painting and photography. She explores such topics as national identity, gender, sexuality, and public space. She has published numerous books, three of which were on Edvard Munch titled Munch and Women, Image and Myth, Edvard Munch, The Modern Life and Soul, and most recently, Munch, Warhol, and The Multiple Image. She tells me her hobbies include hiking, mountain climbing, and skiing. So, welcome. Is the microphone on? I'm reading. Is it? I'm reaching behind me to click it. Can you hear me? Yes. I, heard, I see one head saying no. Can you hear me now? There's still no. Okay. Sorry. I'm having a fashion crisis. Should be on? Yes? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Sorry to take the time. Um, I have to begin by saying that I'm delighted to be here. I'm really honored to be invited to speak. Um, <coughs> Dr. Mednick is a, a long-term collaborator. We've done a number of projects together. And we're a very rare breed on Earth. There are very few people in, in North America specializing in the arts of Scandinavia. So it's wonderful that we can work together, that we can be here together. And I also want to thank so much our hosts, uh, my hosts, for bringing me here from chilly, gray Boston. Uh, where we had like 100 degrees all summer, so I can experience your humidity. It's really, lo really lovely to be here. Um, so I curated the exhibition that's opening a little bit later in your gallery, and I very much look forward to seeing how it was installed here. Um, and what I would like to do in this talk is to take um, it's the exhibitions on Monk's photography. The, ex the photographs are that big, you'll see, the tiny little photographs that he took. Uh, what I would like to do is to focus my talk a little bit on, uh, on his photography, his photographic practice. And when I say focus, it's like a bad pun, right? Uh, uh, um, I want to talk about his photographic practice, but in order to do that, I would like to wrap around a number of stories um, around this photography. Um, what I would like to do is uh, first sort of trace the background um, of and locate the artist uh, in relation to, well, his own work, but also the cultural politics of Norway uh, in his lifetime. I want to discuss uh, his photographs as a form of portraiture, and then I want to talk about portraiture a little more generally. Most of Munch's photographs are of himself. They're almost all self-representations, and as you can see, the one here uh, this is an early uh, self-portrait in oil, and this is a selfie. How many of you have taken selfies? How many of you have never taken a selfie? Okay, that's like more on. Okay, a couple of you. Um, so I want to talk about his practice of creating selfies uh, as early as about 1910. And uh, I want to think a little bit about what it means to look at the self and represent the self, and then to see the self represented once the self is represented. And then I want to um, locate his photography, his selfies, and others. Um, within a kind of a realm or a discussion of experimental art. So I'm going to be talking about Munch, I'm going to be talking about Norway, I'm going to be talking about portraiture and a little bit about experimentation uh, in this talk. And um, hopefully illuminating the ways in which these kind of modest photographs that you're going to see in the gallery have a tremendous resonance in terms of not only the artist's production, but about kind of experimental uh, milieus in the early part of the 20th century. Um, 
So um, how many of you know anything about Edvard Munch? A couple of hands go up. Um, OK, I'll, in a moment, I'll show you why you already know him. Just in a moment, I'll show you a slide. But he was an artist who was born in 1863 in rural Norway, uh, literally so far away from anything except cows and fields and uh, the occasional church and little clustered village. He was the son of a military physician uh, and a homemaker. He was one of five children. And early in his life, when he was still a little kid, his family moved into the booming metropolis of what's modern day Oslo, at, which was at the time called Christiania, which um, w was Norway's premier city, and it only had one paved road. And in fact, in Norway, in the 1860s, when Monk was a child, it was the only paved road in all of Norway. And I think you can see the map here. It's a massive land mass. But if you turn it upside down, it goes all the way down to Sicily. It's massive and incredibly poor when Monk was a small child. It was a very impoverished country. Um, he, I'm going to talk a little bit about his training, but I just want you to remember he died in 1944, so he had a long and robust life. Uh, until the age of 81. He began practicing art uh, when he was a teenager. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the teenage years, and I'll talk a little later about the later years and the selfies. Um, Munch didn't invent the selfie. The, actually, the honor goes to a Amer North American artist named Robert Cornelius, who in 1839, the year that photography was first invented or announced as a medium in Europe, he turned his camera, a, a big, uh, unwieldy camera, back on himself. And um, this is the first selfie that we know about in, in the history of photography. So Munch wasn't the first to practice self-portraiture photography by turning the camera on himself. Uh, and he certainly wasn't the last to do that, um, by any means. And I mean, among others, Ai Weiwei actually was the first artist, I think, to exhibit a selfie. Uh, as a work of art back in 2009 when he was actually arrested. He took a photograph of himself using a smartphone, took a picture in a, cam uh, in a mirror of himself. And so what we see is a photograph um, of the artist reflected in a mirror, and then we see the flash from his, from his phone. And I wanted to use this photograph not to look at Munch through the agency of Ai Weiwei, a contemporary Chinese artist dissident, uh, but to uh, think about the roles of the lens and the mirror as two to primary tools of artists uh, that Moke used as tools throughout his career, and to think about the relationship between the lens and the mirror in the creation of, of, of self-portraiture. So Moke is within a long line of people taking self-images. There are times when, uh, just as a quick introduction, when Moke, Moke was one of the most uh, prolific self-portraitists in a history of Western art. He's often uh, compared to artists such as Vincent van Gogh or uh, Rembrandt in terms of the number of self-portraits that Moe created. He created himself again and again and again over his approximately 70-year um, career as an image maker. And he kept inventing himself in his self-portraiture. He'd often act out parts of various sorts uh, in his <coughs> self-portraiture. He sometimes used photographs as the basis of his paintings. Moreover than not, though, he looked in a mirror, as artists do, in creating self-portraits. And then, in very interesting ways, as in this painting from 1924, entitled The Night Wanderer, it's an oil painting that Monk rendered of himself in his home, um, where he's kind of leaning into the canvas as though he's, you know, like a visitor in his own painting. Uh, but of course, he's standing and looking at a mirror while painting this. Um, it's interesting that there are often the reversals of expectation in the way that Monk used photographs, because rather than using a photograph as the basis of this painting, he actually used this painting as the basis of some of his later selfies, right? Having already painted himself, kind of looking in and thinking about what it means to look in from the edge, to think about framing and the body in relation to the frame, his photographs often reflect or refract backwards onto work that he's already produced as an experimental artist, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. This is why I think you already know Edvard Munch. But how many of you have seen some version of this image before? And was it the painting itself, or was it a blow-up doll, a political cartoon, a necktie? I swear to God, a tea cozy. These, this thing is reproduced 
everywhere. And so you almost can't see it anymore without thinking about it as a piece of kitsch, right? It's been so widely reproduced. But that's why you know more. He painted a painting that is the most reproduced painting in the world. It has now exceeded Mona Lisa, Leonardo's Mona Lisa, as the most reproduced painting. And so he's important to know about in a sense because he's produced something that's so much a part of our contemporary visual culture, which is why I think he's interesting to study and why I think his art is interesting to consider because it's part of our daily lives and our political experience. Um, and I'm going to talk about this painting in another few minutes and its relationship, most relationship to it and its place in his um, career, its relationship to experimentalism. Um, so as I said, he was born in 1863 in this very poor country. Um, he grew up in the city of Christiania, which was a very poor city, small little city, um, self-involved little city. It was on the edge, virtually the edge of Europe. Um, and he, early on, was sent by his father, a deeply religious man and a deeply practical man. He was sent to engineering school because, you know, and build things and make money and be successful. And then most of the thing that maybe some of you have done is to say, I think I want to be an artist instead. And um, he left, he dropped out of school, went to briefly to art school. There was a tiny little art school in Christiania. There was very little artistic infrastructure in that city. He dropped out of that school as well. And he was lucky enough to get some state scholarships to study in Paris and which we'll talk about in a minute, seeing the works of artists such as Paul Gauguin, which we've um, just seen. He said when he dropped out of school, he wrote in his notebooks, now I'm going to be a great artist. 17, he said that. And you know, many of us believe at 17 we're going to be creative geniuses. So he actually went and, went and did it. He had an unbelievable will of iron and produced until the day he died. He was an enormously productive artist. Um, he... Another selfie here. Love the thought of the guy with his little camera talking to himself, looking at himself in the studio. And then a self-portrait from 1942, in which he stands as a very old man, his feet slightly splayed, his hands opened by his sides. And in this painting, which is rather sizable, he's surrounded himself, um, almost like curating his existence with a lot of his, his paintings from his past as he represents himself in his studio. So I just wanted to get some markers of how the artist looked to himself in the early 1880s and then again in the 1940s, bracketing essentially his career. Um, I, I also am including a photograph of his early family. Uh, one of the stories that Monk carried with him throughout his life, his biographers emphasize, and that had something to do with of the ways in which he uh, created his work was the fact that he did come from a family with five children. Um, and I'm showing you a picture of the five. Um, there's little Edvard looking, you know, kind of from the side here. His mother died of tuberculosis when he was a very small child, shortly after this photograph was taken. Uh, one of his older sisters died of tuberculosis uh, as she was just entering her puberty and as he was entering, uh, as he was entering his puberty. One of his sisters was diagnosed with what would be called schizophrenia today and was institutionalized throughout most of her life. And so one of the stories of most early life was one of, of loss and of witnessing loss. And, of, um, and in, in those days, when someone died, they were in state in the home for a period of time. So as a small child, he, he witnessed illness and decline and death and then a body before the bodies left the home. And that was just how life worked in the middle and later part of the 19th century in Christiania. And he um, is often stereotyped as a very highly depressed, heavy, uh, uh, carrying the heavy burden of all these losses throughout all of his work. And I just want to offer this here as a, as a beginning, uh, because he did move back into these stories of his childhood, again, and drawing upon them but not because he was so heavily depressed and burdened all the time, but because he felt that, and, and he said this, and we'll see this a little later, that by um, digging into what's essential in oneself, one's essential experiences, by confronting the self again and again and again, 
you're offering an authentic interpretation of your own experience to others who may also have experienced something as you have. Loss, love, eroticism. Um, the things that he thought were markers of a human life, all the stages of a human life that are deeply felt are the things that he wished to make visible. Uh, so here he begins um, in the 1880s, first with a bad typo, he begins with a self-portrait rendered in a very kind of traditional naturalistic um, style. It's a kind of a typical adolescent first-time portrait with mysterious light from the side. He's looking slightly down, a little bit arrogant. He loves his lips all the way through his life. He loved his lips. A <laughs> little bit of hair out of place here. It gives him kind of that romantic, you know, bandit look. So it's beautifully, beautifully rendered in the way that an art professor would tell you in 1880. It's like a really great painting, right? Within two years, he's reimagined himself um, slightly differently, still looking down, looking sideways at us, still loving those plump lips. Um, but this time, painted in a way that makes him almost indistinct. And after rendering the composition in layers of oil, he's taken the back end of his paintbrush and he's scored the surface. He just ruined his own surface. So he's scoring into his own face and creating a kind of um, image, self-damaged and um, almost unreadable, that was considered at the time to not even be a painting, but that was uh, the initiation of a kind of remarkable uh, um, experimentalism. In that same year, 1884, he rendered this composition, which is enormous, almost like size of two figures, a girl in a bed, uh, a woman uh, bowed down next to her. It's entitled The Sick Child. He initiated this painting um, witnessing with, with a model, a young model who he hired to be sitting in this bed that he could paint her and he sketched her. And there are numerous sketches of, of this composition. And of course, it's a girl with medicine bottles in the foreground here, a little still life of medicine bottles, another uh, little uh, container of medicine here. Barely discernible is a window, a little curtain with light coming in from the side, a large pillow behind the head of this child who's silhouetted, the woman holding the hand of this child. And it's a standard representation of a child who's literally dying of tuberculosis. It's a representation of a tuberculosis child with the inevitability, in some way or another, of loss up to and including the little um, additions of red onto the pillow. And in this composition, too, Lowe took the back end of his brush and scored the surface of his painting and repainted it and scored the surface of his painting. So when you actually see it in the flesh, um, it's a detail, but it's still so hard to see. When you see it, you recognize that there are rivulets of paint running down the surface. He's, he's taken a dry brush and he's painted across the image again and again and again and then torn the surface of the paint again and again. And what he said in his, in his writings was that he couldn't get it right, and it's as though, uh, this is widely quoted about this painting, looking at the dying girl is like he was, uh, the, the, the stripes of paint on the surface represent uh, himself looking at the scene of death through tears that are, uh, have, have uh, accumulated on his eyelashes. So it's as though you're looking through your tears at this scene. And of course, it's a scene that, as many have commented upon, is a memory scene, maybe something drawn from the memory of his early losses, but that he's reconstituted as a memory, and as something distant and distinct. And it's very interesting that a painter would um, create a painting that is telling you a story so you can't see the details right? at this point in the 1880s. So you can recognize the all over scene, but what becomes more apparent when you look at the painting is the, is the destro destroyed surface. So there's something in the way of the technique itself telling the story in as much as motif tells the story, of loss, of pain, of distance. And also the destroyed image kind of sets up a, a, a kind of literal distance uh, from the scene, and in fact, uh, many times in his diaries, and then we'll publish later on when he became famous, some of his aphorisms, I paint what I, not what I see, but what I saw. And this becomes important in understanding his work. He was very committed to the idea of his motifs being filtered through memory rather than often direct observation. 
that memory is something that each time you touch upon a memory, each time you remember something, you bring it forward into consciousness. And remembering is something you bring forward, and you always transform by the present moment. Right. Memories are never the same. And memories are never the same thing as an originary lived event. And he was fascinated by that idea of what one could see and what one couldn't see, what's tangible, what's intangible. And this began his experimental career of trying to create images and a variety of media that would in some way or another uh, both be immediate and somewhat distanced by the mechanism of memory. And this is something he thought that we all as humans um, share. Just a quick reminder of where Norway is located on the sort of edge of Europe. Here's Oslo, a map of Europe. Here's a map of Scandinavia. Oslo at the time called Christiania, as I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> incredibly poor city in a poor country. Briefly, you know from your own studies, I think this semester, as many of you are studying the history of Scandinavia, Norway was an expansive and wealthy um, country which had been unified, but which um, in the latter part of the 14th century became part of a union with Sweden, modern Sweden, modern, modern Denmark. Over the course of 430 years, Norway became a possession of Denmark. And during the Napoleonic Wars, Denmark fought on the wrong side. And Norway, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, was actually taken away from Denmark in the, uh, under the, uh, the Treaty of Kiel and ceded to Sweden. So Norway became a possession of Sweden, having been a possession of Denmark for four centuries. What that meant in the 19th century, so starting in, in 1814, what that meant in the 19th century was that Norway had a robust um, uh, 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 economic base in shipping, in lumber, in pig iron, and in copper. So Norway was an enormously productive uh, geography in terms of, of natural resources. But all of it went to the, the money always went to the sort of so-called overlords, first to Denmark and to Sweden. Norway didn't have its own consular force, couldn't make its own decisions about international contact and so on. And over the course of the 19th century, Norway got its own parliament in 1814. And at that moment, from 1814 onward, an enormously powerful, consistent nationalist movement arose among intellectuals in Norway, nation builders, who used, as we just saw, sort of painting, landscape, um, a range of media uh, as kind of enforcers of Norwegian nests over the course of the 19th century. Architecture, design, painting, uh, folk tales, all of these things collected, and all of these things brought forward by intellectuals of, of the 19th century to convince Nor Norwegians that they actually were one unit. They were not Danish, they were not Swedes, that the land was ancient and nurturing, that the buildings that farmers and peasants had been creating over the millennia were nor truly Norwegian, etc. Um, this rhetoric of exclusiveness and belonging began to come to a head around 1900. And I'm showing you here a poster from the world's, uh, from the 1889 Universal Exposition uh, in Paris, which was so much about, um, um, you know, industry and progress here with the Eiffel Tower built for the 1889 Exposition. Um, in, 18, in 1900, the Universal Exposition in Paris which is a little less famous for specific landmarks such as this one, the, eight, the 1900 Universal Exposition in Paris um, included a range of pavilions that were built from nations all over the world. And each nation built its own pavilion in the architectural style that they thought was most essential to its identity. And so um, Spain is here, Belgium is here, and here's Norway, which built its own pavilion to show the rest of the world how absolutely Norwegian it was. It was designed uh, by an architect based on the model of medieval uh, wooden church architecture, so that anybody traveling through Paris could look at, you know, walk up and down these 
the, the go up and down the Seine or walk uh, back and forth across all of these buildings. And it was like Epcot. It's like, you know, 1900 Epcot Center. You can go from country to country to country to country. Some countries offering themselves as modern, most of them looking at themselves in a very uh, uh, kind of, a, well, a historical manner, going back into the past to demonstrate their essence, their national essence, which was the kind of story of that um, exposition. And I'm showing it to you. Um, I'm showing it to you. I'm also here juxtaposing you know, this notion of industry here from 1889. Because in the handbook of Norway that was published in 1900 for the Universal Exposition in Paris, there was a big, thick book that Norway published to demonstrate to the rest of the world its distinctiveness. There was a, a section on geography, a section on geology at the beginning of the tour. The, the, um, the, geo, the, the geology of Norway, a geologist said Norway had the oldest rocks on the planet, or older than Denmark. <laughs> and, uh, says you. Says I didn't write it. Um, but uh, in the anthropology section, this was very important for the whole world to see that Norwegians, that Scandinavians were the tallest people, had the, had, the, the, um, the lightest complexion, had the broadest shoulders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And among them, Norwegians are characterized as the whole as the fairest among the so-called white races, just as we've seen that they're the tallest after the Americans who ate better. Um, <laughs> this idea of constituting an ethnic connectedness, a national connectedness, a connectedness to the land, a connectedness to architecture, helped to fuel this, this nationalist movement which in 1905, the year 1905, um, produced Norway's independence from Sweden. And so I'm showing you a, a popular, one of many popular broadsides that was published that has all of the makings of kind of a national story. You know, an imagined blonde woman, a kind of a woman warrior with a royal seal and, a, and a, a, an axe and an ancient monument and the mountains and the snow, all the whole nine yards and a room. All of these things taken together as like icons of nationhood um, within painting of Munch's generation. I'm going to return to Munch in a moment, but I'm just trying to set up this uh, story of this artist who came out of a milieu that was not very welcoming to experimentation in the arts. Many of the artists of Munch's generation, the generation right before him, uh, were committed to painting the scenes and the themes that were part of Norwegian nation building. Peasants at a peasant burial, 1885, Erik um, uh, an enormously important uh, Norwegian artist of the generation right before Moks, a great proponent of Moks' work. There are mountains, there is snow, there are trees, there's a stone wall built in by the hands of those people standing here at a modest grave. Um, this, these um, highly romanticized pictures of what peasant life was like in the countryside, painting after painting, exhibition after exhibition, really celebrated that, those ideas of nativist values. In landscape painting, parallel to intersecting with what Tor Mednick just talked about, uh, there arose a, a generation of painters in the 1880s, Mokhish generation, Kitty Hjellon among them, who is intent upon representing Norway's land as kind of manifest with meaning, as kind of spiritualized. And there was a kind of a, a theme that emerged, it was called a, a mood painting, critics called it mood painting, of landscape paintings such as this, which are really about nothing other than mood as it was constituted at the time, right? That the, it's really the sky and the light that were seen as the story of this painting and not a woman in a rowboat or a, or a horse or a farm. I mean, the opposite of what uh, Tor Mednick was just saying about thinking about modern, modernism. This was seen as kind of a, a, a manifestation of an ancient sustaining world as seen through light. So this was, this was what um, the audience at the time was craving in Norway. This is what artists are often representing in Norway. And well, too, in some of his paintings, such as a representation of one of his sisters up sitting by the sea on a series of rocks in this kind of twilight, uh, contemplating, and he was part of this scene as well. But then out of nowhere comes the sick child in the 1880s. 
and um, with its scored surface. And it's taking the idea of death and instead of hiding it behind a closed door, making it prominent and making it painful and making it not so pretty in this painting. So this is what Monk began to do, is to just challenge the norms of painting in his home country. And then increasingly, as he exhibited around Europe, his work, his work was understood to represent this new direction in a very empathic kind of painting, in a challenging and experimental kind of painting. And I'm just showing you um, among the things that he wrote about his desires at the time, not to represent again what one can see and not what is on the surface of things, but to dig deeply and to offer the depth of emotion. And whether, even if it's an emotion that's horrifying, that that's genuine. So that brings us to this painting. Before I move into the photographs, I want to say a word or two about the screen. Monk painted it in 1893. It was based on a memory that he had. He wrote in his diaries. I was walking down the road uh, one night with a friend. And as I walked, the sky turned red. It was twilight. The sky turned red. It turned red like blood. No, the sky became coagulated and I fell to my knees and felt a street pierce all of nature under the blood red sky. It's a little prose poem. In which what one can see, which is the sunset, is translated into suddenly a felt experience, a bodily experience, right? a complete enveloping experience. And so he painted this composition in part based on that. Now, of course, that was a memory walking in Norway in 1891. He wrote the prose poem a little bit later, and then he wrote it when he was living in France, and then he painted the painting even later. So the painting's not about an immediate experience, but a poetically evoked memory of something that then turns into a figure on a bridge in a landscape with two figures in the background completely ignoring this figure in extremis. Painted the composition in such a way that the, um, the raking perspective shoves the creature into our space so that we immediately feel kind of somewhat toppled uh, by the by the every vision experience and then the entire landscape resonates with and is coupled with the gesture of the figure. It's rendered in oil paint, a milk based paint, pencil, and pastel, all of it mixed together. Again, experimentally, not the thing you're supposed to do is mix all that media together. In the 1890s, it was another attempt on the part of the artist to try to explain something uh, materially while making a motif that's visual. For people who live locally in Christiania, it's recognizable as a Christiania harbor um, with um, the church here in the background with a couple of merchant ships on the surface of the water. So it was a known scene and therefore it's anchored in lived experience in some way or another, but in that end translated into a representation. And it's that piece about translation into a representation uh, that I'd like to talk uh, about. And for whatever reason or other, it just keeps living on as something that we understand to be um, part of our own experience. In 1895, two years after painting this composition, we'll render it again in lithography. So this is a lithograph that we made, uh, drawing on a lithographic stone and printed multiple times. And I'm mentioning it because in 1895, in that year, Hope became a printmaker as well as, uh, as well as a painter. And it's in that year he created two self-portraits I want to talk about for a moment with you. And remember, here he is in this milieu that's deeply conservative, that's very inward looking, and that's valuing peasants and peasant housing and state churches. Um, and he rendered himself in this self-portrait in oil and mixed media as a kind of a bohemian, standing in a cafe or standing in the nowhere, we can imagine a cafe, smoking a cigarette, lit from uh, below, and instead of holding a paintbrush, as would expect a painter to do it, so for it's holding the cigarette. And then the smoke becomes this kind of diaphanous film that both uh, highlights his face and then hides the surrounding from us, both things. And so it's a representative of himself as a bohemian. This point, he's living in Berlin, he's left Christiania, and he begins to travel all through Europe and relocate himself into the world's uh, cap art capitals. And around the time he painted this self-portrait, which is almost which is life-size, it's enormous, and very confrontational. He painted this, and he created this lithographic stone in which he rendered 
a self-portrait, and below him is a, the arm of a skeleton, and up above he's written his name, Edward Moon, in the year 1895. It almost looks like a tombstone. So he rendered that, and then he very quickly took deep black touche, thick lithic medium of lithography, and covered the stone, covered all of this. There's only one print that remains, like one uh, artist proof of this stage of the print. And he painted over it, so now his face emerges out of absolute darkness, um, with a skeleton arm below and the name up above. It's this choice to, to make something extreme and to make something that has more symbolic weight and more charge uh, than a more naturalistic representation where he took the self-portraiture. Um, now here, I'm bringing in two quotes from contemporary theorists around portraiture and self-portraiture, which I'm going to explain now in a minute. If you look at this very intense view of the artist looking at himself, and then we looking at him, um, Hans Georg Gadamer says that the portrait is only an intensified form of the general nature of the picture. I'm going to explain that in a second. And then T.J. Clark, the art historian, says self-portrait is an infinite dialectical regress. I'll explain that now, too. Sort of using this as a point of departure. Um, a portrait is an intensified form of the general nature of the picture. When we see a picture, we see a painting, we see a photograph, we see any representation, we have to remember it's only a representation and it's not the thing in itself. Always different than lived experience. Whether you're looking at a photograph or a highly modified self-image such as this one, right? Um, we have to remember that we, we often forget that we're not looking at the person. Even when we're looking at a photograph, we're not looking at the people. We're looking at a series of filtered modifications of those people. This is a photograph of Monk and his girlfriend at the time. His name is Tula Larson. He's going to come up in this story in five minutes. And they're in a photographic studio. And uh, they may or may not be wearing borrowed clothing because photographic studios at the time had costume closets the way they kind of do. Anybody ever go to those booths and look at a pair to put on somebody else's hat or like a cowboy or whatever? But one could do that in the 19th century. And there's a false background behind them. There's a tree. And there are all kinds of props here that are, of course, the people that we see, Edward Mook, standing there. But they are themselves and they're not themselves. It's a representation of it at a particular moment, posing in a particular way. And um, here is a portrait he's made of himself, which is, I guess, an intensification of the idea of a representation that's never the thing in itself in the first place. So a, self, a portrait is always modified from the subject, right? Always modified, never the same as the subject itself. And a self-portrait, if a portrait is always not quite the same thing as lived experience, but an artist's imaginary or desired or projected image of the self, a self-portrait is even more an intensification. And um, the idea of a dialectical regress, here's what I want to explain. And here's what he wrote in these old photographs. Think about it. Here's the early painting by Monk that we saw from 1884. Here's one from around 1903 entitled Self-Portrait of Hell Pope, oh. um, in which he's imagined himself. And he's also, as he signed his initials right above his drawing. So all together, he's giving us all kinds of visual material that is horrifying. Right? Um, when we look at this, the infinite dialectical regress that T.J. Clark talks about is as follows. When we look at a self-portrait by him, the artist is looking at us. We look back at the artist. We seem to be looking at each other. So right there we get trapped in the thinking that we know the subject by looking. And what we forget is that in the end, the artist is not looking at us at all because the artist can't. The artist is looking at a mirror and looking at a, a painting from the 17th century. 
who recently has come up with a theory that Rembrandt, in making his self-portraits, was working both with concave mirrors and flat mirrors to be able to see himself in various ways and register himself. Okay, the artist's new mirrors. The mirror is the thing that the artist sees, so the infinite regresses. We think we're seeing the artist, but we're looking at a reflection of the artist that the artist has tried to capture. And so we're involved in this kind of funny three-way movement, three-way moment, or more, whenever we see a self-portrait. I'm showing you a late photograph of Monk as an old man sitting in the studio, and I'm showing it to you because one of his most important studio tools is sitting here in the corner of the studio. It's a mirror, um, which is reflecting, I love it, a little box of what's called Viking milk. Go for here. But, um, but there's, you know, each, in this photograph are his paintings and his prints and his bills and his top one and the giant mess. I think that was his studio life. But there's the mirror. A Danish, uh, sorry, Finnish painter named Maria Beek looking at herself while painting herself in a mirror. Helena Scharfbeck, who painted radical self-portraits of herself at the turn of the century into the 1940s, as Moon did. We're looking at her, she's looking at us, she's actually looking at herself, she's looking at herself in a mirror. So what we see are a series of acts of artists when we look at self-portraits of artists who um, are deep in two acts that I find really fascinating. And I, I study self-portrait because I'm really interested in this. On the one hand, when you're looking at yourself intensely in the mirror, as some of us sometimes do, um, we're both trying to learn something about ourselves. We're also objectifying ourselves. We try to see ourselves as we can see ourselves. We see ourselves as others see us. When you're an artist, and I, I used to paint, I guess there are a lot of artists in here, but when you're looking at yourself in the mirror and paint a self-image, you have to both be digging deep and pushing away at the same time to be able to see yourself. Do you, if you make it, if that's making sense. And so in order to make the self into a motif, and to make the self into a motif as strange as Helena Scharfbeck's late self-portrait, or as strange as some of those portraits get, you have to be able to take the self and think about the self as an other. And so by using a mirror and making a self-portrait, you're othering yourself in order to come back to the self again. And that's part of this notion of infinite redress. When Mok bought, bought his first camera in 1902, he was already famous as a painter and as a printmaker. And then he had some rough times at the beginning of the 20th century, and he bought a little handheld camera. And began to use it. So the photographs of the show that you're going to see begin around 1902. Here's one of them. Um, he bought a cheap Kodak camera, and then he bought a cheap home development kit. This is a picture of one of the development kits. And well, let's remember, as a printmaker, as an experimental printmaker, he began to make some of his own photographic prints in this kind of portable box. And so he was able to take pictures with his camera develop his own film, take a look at it, see what worked and what didn't work, and then go on to take more pictures. And what he did as a photographer was a little bit like what he did as a printmaker or as a, as a painter. The stuff that didn't work was the stuff he loved. Out of focus, strange moving images, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, this, he's made, uh, he took a photograph of himself in a hotel somewhere where he was uh, traveling in there in 1904. And then he became so interested in what would happen when you took a neg photographic negative and then flipped it. So you could make the same image, but you could make it backwards, which is what a current maker would do, right? experimenting with um, the, the um, medium itself. As a print maker, Moog was one of the most innovative print makers in Europe at the turn of the of 20th century. One of the things that he began to do was he studied Japanese print making technique, and he was able to look at the work of Goga and others uh, both in Asia and Europe, which were collected and assembled in various collections, he took a jigsaw and then he would take his uh, wooden matrices and he cut them, so like jigsaw pieces, and he inked them separately and then pieced them together again and made prints, each one very distinct in color and in detail from the other. And then he would often hand modify them when he painted. So his prints. Um, are, um, were um, created as, here's a detail.
some of the, the lines that separate the various areas of his prints. But his woodblock prints began to be valued as being these experimental years in which every single print was different from one another in texture and in coloration. Um, he, uh, in rendering this composition called Kiss, the foreign version of the motif from around 1902, oops, um, from around 1902, I want to point out that he made this composition of a man and a woman in, in, in enveloping one another, engaged in the act of kissing as though they were a single lozenge, a single form. And not only did he print the image of the figures, but then he took a block of wood and just inked the wood and printed that as well. So what he's printed is the wood itself is something we can see as, as a matrix, and then the figures that kind of emerge through uh, and embedded in the wood. And often in his prints, when he made his own prints, the figures sort of disappeared in the art. And that's something that was unacceptable for good printing. And this is, I guess, the point I want to make about Munch as an artist. He knew the rules of good painting. He knew the rules of good printmaking. He knew the rules of good photography. Uh, he didn't care. <laughs> he liked the, the mistakes were the areas where he felt something genuine was beginning to happen. Something untrained, something un unexpected. So quickly as I as I am, and then as we soon move into the gallery, I want to just train your eye to think of, look at what you're seeing, and let's think about Wolf making these images. The self-portrait photograph from 1907. He's standing in his studio. He's traveled to Germany. He's living on the German coast. He's standing with some of his paintings, and um, he's a ghost. Right? He's intangible. You can see all the background through his body. Here's another one, where he's sitting at a table in the same town from 1907. He's speaking with a woman, and look at him. He's not very, he's a ghost. Once again, he's moved. Now, um, the, in the history of photography, from the very beginning of photography, photographic manuals, like this one from the 1850s, right, this photographic pleasures, um, explain that if you move, while you're taking a picture, you disappear. And so here's a lady who was sneezing <laughs> while her picture was being taken. It's a warning sign. Kodak published books that explain with their new little camera not to move when you're taking your picture or you will be indistinct. Um, but Monk and almost all of his pictures when you go to the gallery, you'll see he's, he's a ghost. He's moving. You can always see the background. Or he's way too close and he's out of focus. He began to use photography against itself. Photography is supposed to be that thing that shows you sharply the world as you live it. For him, this idea of, I paint what I saw and not what I see. Mm -hmm. I photograph what I feel and not what the camera can register. It's a very strange way of using photograph. At the time, of course, he was really fascinated by ghost photography. This was the era starting in the 1860s, showing the famous a page of uh, photographs from a famous Boston uh, photographer named Mummer, who was able to photograph more ghosts than any other photographer in the 1860s <laughs> until he was sued for fraud. But it was Mary Todd Lincoln with Abraham Lincoln standing behind her, a deeply uh, reassuring image if you're going to the studio with a ghost photographer. There's also the era of x rays. And so it was a Swedish invention. Lundgren made the first uh, x ray in 1895. It's a photograph of his wife's hand wearing a ring. Monk had the unfortunate uh, um, experience of being shot in the hand by, while well, grappling with his girlfriend in 1902. We don't know who shot the bullet, but he lodged in his finger, he lost part of his finger. So there's an x ray of Monk's hand with a bullet lodged in it. And so it's, well, we know Monk liked those photographs. We knew he saw x-rays, very specifically this one. Um, just very quickly, this is the girlfriend. We've seen her before, Tula Larson. Um, they were together for a couple of years. They were thinking they might marry. They decided he decided not to marry her. He decided never to marry because his art was his wife, whatever. <laughs> um, but it was a... And this image haunted him as well of the accident, whatever happened, whatever transpired, when a pistol was fired and damaged him. It caused enormous pain. And he took a photograph of himself, which you see in the gallery, and it's a photograph which has been called uh, self-portrait in documentation.
Dr. Jacobson's cl clinic where he was in Copenhagen uh, for his nerves, a la Marat. And when you see it, it's referring, of course, it, there it is someone naked uh, in a, uh, a hospital setting in a bathtub right next to him in this hospital room. And it's referring to Jean-Louis David's famous uh, death of Marat, this uh, death of the counter revolutionary uh, right after the right time of the French Revolution. And uh, so he then also painted a sequence of images of himself as the dead or dying Marat, with his ex-girlfriend here as the figure Charlotte Corday, who shot Marat. So, you know, Mo was continually wrapping around in his own mind his life experience, images from others, painting, printmaking, photography, history, the present, and always working against uh, what good judgment would tell other artists to do. Here's this self work You'll see it in the exhibition um, as well. So it's a photograph, it's a little bitty photograph that's staged by the artist, that was taken by the artist using a cable release of himself, staging himself in this space, more or less as a historical character. So of the time and not of the time. A kind of an infinite regress, both with us as we see the photograph, and with the history that he was bringing up, both his own history and that of his, uh, of his predecessors. Finally, um, two final points I'll make about the photographs and about all of this experimentation. And again, within the context of Norwegian, I have to say, a kind of conservatism in his home country, a kind of a lack of regard for this kind of experimental <coughs> work. Um, well, here he is as a ghost man is standing late in his life against his work. Um, I'm sh showing you this side by side again with a woodcut to remind us that when Wolf took these photographs, they were not intended to be viewed by the public. I think he'd be, he would have not been super happy about somebody from Massachusetts standing in front of you showing his private pictures. Um, but he gave them, he left them in a portfolio that said that maybe in the future others might Others might see them and learn from them. So I think he had a feeling that in his own lifetime, these would just be seen as a big hot mess with him moving in front of the camera or out of focus. But he got his ideas from his other artistic work and tried them out on, on a camera um, in a medium that was resistant to that kind of experimentation. He also, this is one of my favorite photographs you've seen the show. I just want to show it to you because I have um, he always had a lot of dogs. He, in, in his late life, he bought a house, he had a little farm, and he had a lot of dogs. And this is a portrait of one of his dogs. But it's a self photo as well, because there's his shadow on the side. And he often, I'd like you to keep an eye on the photographs. He appears as a shadow, he appears as a ghost, he appears out of focus. You will never, he's very elusive in his photographs. He's always his own experimental arena. When they're looking in the mirror, or imagining himself in front of the lens. He's shadowed, and he took that from paintings that he had already done, there's one from the 1920s, of a landscape looking out of his back door with a double sh a shadow, another shadow. So he's present, but at the same time not present. Um, he didn't invent the selfie. He didn't want these to be necessarily seen in his lifetime. They're entirely experimental. They're the most private of his work. But these little photographs, I think, help us to see the larger arena of his experimental work, his resistance to the good rules of comportment, his resistance to the good rules of pain, and of nation building at the time. And coming out of this country at the edge of nowhere, that until the 1970s, really didn't have a lot of institutional growth. Here was an artist who made a huge impact on the world in his own lifetime. And through all of our little caricatures of the screen and whatnot, um, continues. <coughs> and again, this is one of his most famous aphorisms. That the camera will never compete with the Russian palette until such time as photography can be taken in heaven or hell. Um, and of course, you can think about this in a lot of ways. But I think for him, the camera, was, um, was uh, uh, an instrument of invention and not recording. And that's 